the two things that make an active engaged community is one, a human element of a person who's in charge of the community, plus technology. And I feel like technology for the past decade or decade and a half has been just like an email list, like a newsletter, and maybe like uh, Eventbrite. Like that was the technology. And I think like we're now jumping a little bit ahead and there's there's so much technology that can be built to keep a community active and engaged. Welcome everybody. I'm Mark Peter Davis, Managing Partner of Interplay Ventures. On this podcast, I interview innovators about their strategies, industries, and decisions. This week, I chat with Alex Taub, co-founder and CEO of Upstream. Upstream is a digital platform that is redefining professional networking. Now, over the years, I've watched many community platforms fail. I don't know the exact stats, but the success rate is very low. I think one of the reasons a community platform is so hard to build is that it requires so many features to deliver sufficient value. Upstream seems to have broken through by rapidly iterating on features and keeping the product lean overall. They've delivered a complete product fairly quickly, and the platform appears to be scaling. In addition to running Upstream, Alex manages one of the communities on the platform, the NFT community. We get into a general overview of what NFTs are, plus chat about some of his favorite projects, which include a digital horse racing game called Zed Run. If you're interested in understanding NFTs and how to profit from them, I'd have a listen. Enjoy. This episode is brought to you by Foundershield. Foundershield is a tech-enabled commercial and health insurance brokerage that focuses on servicing high-growth companies. They service thousands of VC-backed and public companies, including many of the brand names you probably know. If you're interested in learning more, visit foundershield.com. Welcome, Alex. What's going on? How you doing? Good. Thanks for being here today. Of course. Anything. Anything for you. I appreciate that. All right. I'm going to do your intro for you. A little background okay. with the hope of putting it a little, some out there. I'm probably going to miss some stuff. So if I do, tell me. So Alex Taub is the co-founder and CEO of Upstream. Uh, now, for those who are listening to this who don't know, Upstream is a new mobile-first community platform that is absolutely exploding. Uh, I am a super active user of the app. I think I run more than a dozen communities on Upstream at this point. I also invest in the company's friends and family round, and it's been an absolute pleasure to watch Alex Scale, who I've known for quite a long time. Alex has been a longtime super connector in the New York startup tech scene, and now in Miami. He's not only started numerous companies, but he worked at a myriad of very prominent BD roles early in his career. He recently moved to Miami and has been helping to pioneer the ecosystem down there. Uh, and he's also a very outspoken proponent and active uh, trader in the NFT space. He was an early adopter of both MBA Top Shop and Zed Run, and I am sure we're going to dive into that a little bit. Alex, anything I miss that you want to throw in? Um, yeah, that was... That was it. I mean, I did I did two years at Aviary, two years at Dewalla before I started Social Rank. Um, but before that, when we initially met, I was working with the these two Israeli guys. I don't know if you remember this. These two Israeli guys were trying to monetize online video. Um, ended up not working out, but the next company that those guys started ended up being a billion dollar company. Um, what company did if, they start next? What was the So they started a cybersecurity company. They're one of the preeminent Israel cybersecurity companies. Amazing. Um, and, uh, it's pretty, it's, it's controversial company a little bit actually. Uh, but also they've done some good stuff. They actually caught like El Chapo and things like that. It's called NSO. Wow. So they're, wow. they're, was, um, they started that company. I, I had Jeff Buskang, uh, who's the, one of the managing partners over at Flybridge and a professor at HBS on the show a week ago, two weeks ago, something like that. I, don't, I think it was just released. And we talked about how you never know who's going to be who in the startup community. You kind of got to be cool to everybody, which is good practice anyway. But you turn a corner three years later, you find out someone's absolutely you know, elevated in what they've done and done something cool. So yeah. it's kind of an interesting dynamic in that way. All right, let's, yeah. let's get started. Um, you mind telling us a little bit about Upstream? This is your underhand pitch to get us going. Yeah, no, so we started Upstream. Um, 
You know, the actual origin of when Upstream really started is is definitely something for debate. Uh, we started thinking a lot about it at the beginning of 2019 and um, put a, uh, put something in test flight uh, in like June, the summer of 2019. Um, and the idea was LinkedIn has this monopoly. They've been around for the past 18 years and um, they basically own professional social. Um, but they've dropped the ball on a few things. So uh, specifically, um, you know, groups, uh, we basically identified three things that we thought we, there was like an opportunity around professional groups, the API and like strength of relationship. Who do you know and how well you know them? Uh, but we started with groups and, and LinkedIn groups is basically an abysmal product. Nobody really uses it. Anyone who's building a new professional community is doing it on Slack or WhatsApp or Telegram or Discord. And I love all those products. They're just not really meant for professional community. Um, so we started with like, okay, can we build a better professional sort of groups product and, and start with that? So we started with the ability to give and get help. That was like the, the insight we had was like, okay, we can build this place where you can give and get help and these communities can be sort of formed. And we released that, um, sort of end of 2019. And when the beginning of 2020 started, when COVID hit, we, we sort of, uh, evolved to add, uh, virtual events and that really sort of took off. Yeah, I think LinkedIn had more group functionality back in the day and actually gutted it. Yeah. It, it seems like it's clearly not co core to the platform for how they probably hit what drives revenue, impressions, and all that. No, but they, they seem to have sliced it down over time. Do you Which know their overarching is, strategy? It's usually a good thing. It's usually a good thing to slice down product. I think what, for them, they're like, okay, we're a data company. We're selling data to recruiters. And if we have an API, we're going to be basically giving away that data for free. So like they killed a lot of things because of that. But um, listen, they are the best like digital resume. Like I, I use LinkedIn every day, all the time. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to kill LinkedIn. Um, I just think that there's more players in the professional network, professional social space that could play. And uh, we want to be one of them. Yeah, some of the groups that we operate on Upstream, we actually have clone groups. The original groups are on LinkedIn, but the engagement, it's, it's a mess. There's no way to really have a conversation or any, any semblance of a real interaction, uh, yeah. which is frustrating. And, okay, and by right the way, on. Okay. just Mark, to, to go to that. Like, yeah. So th the way that we sort of think about it is right now, most things on Upstream are very live and synchronous. So like this event, like we need to be here, you, people need to show up. You do office hours. Like if nobody takes your office hours, there's not much you can really do. Um, there's other pieces like, uh, like the asks are really more like asynchronous. Like you can ask and then come back like a few days later, someone can see it and post. They don't have to be there live. We're going to add more asynchronous experiences on upstream. And then we're also going to add more like utility. So something we're working on actively right now around utility is like, what does it look like that like, the professional, the way we sort of see it, there's two sides to upstream. There's like the, there's the groups and the, and the sort of like the community side. And then there's the, um, like the professional life cycle and like where we're playing right now in the professional life cycle and trying to give you like a visual of what the way my brain yeah, thinks a little it. bit, but like mm -hmm. the professional like life cycle, there's all these different things that a professional does. And like, if you think about like where we are right now, we're like, Give, um, like meeting new people and socializing is very popular on upstream. Like a lot of people come and use upstream and they meet people. Um, that's, but that's very dependent on other people being there. There's other pieces to the professional life cycle that aren't as dependent to people being there. So for example, like following up or reaching out or reconnecting all these different things that professionals do daily that don't necessarily depend on other people being there at that moment, at that time to, uh, for it to be useful. So that's where we're thinking about right now around utilities. What other tools do professionals use daily that we could theoretically um, build better? Are you ever going to merge into full business profiles? A little bit more like what LinkedIn's kind of core is? Not, not like, not as, not soon. Um, our focus is going to be more on like the groups and community stuff. And then mm -hmm. some of the, some of the utility stuff, like, the the white whale problem of like who do you know and how well you know them is something that's been very much top of mind for for the last uh, few months. I've seen a lot of companies over the years try to solve that. I want to say a company a year for a decade try to figure yeah. that out how to harvest Soft. the data from LinkedIn and make sense of it. 
that feature hasn't landed yet. There's companies out there now even trying to do it, but I haven't seen it widely used. So, but why you, right? You're a BD guy, you built some product stuff, you, you're good at analytics, you've been in the startup community for a long time. Why did, of all the things you could do, why did you decide to tackle the white space in the professional social networking? It's a great question. Um, so it requires a little bit of context. Um, we had a company called Social Rank uh, from 2014. Michael Schoenfeld and myself, uh, my co-founder, we started it together. We left Dewalla, the payment startup, and we started this. Uh, it was actually like a creator tool before creator tools like was the was the popular word. Um, and uh, we were dependent on like uh, Instagram and Twitter, and really like dependent on the data. And we got burned many times, uh, but we built a business and we ended up selling in 2019. But while we were, once we realized that there was, you know, once we realized that there was, there was no, um, we couldn't build a bigger company because we were so dependent on the data from Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. We basically put it on autopilot. We had customers like the NBA, the NFL, Netflix, Samsung, L'Oreal, like blue, blue chip customers. Um, but we mm -hmm. put it on autopilot. And what we did is we just decided to think about ideas that we would want to like actually work on. Um, and we had two rules. The first rule was don't build on top of a third party API, uh, like a Twitter and Instagram again. Uh, if you're going to build on an API, pay for it. Um, and like, you know, cause like this, this video player right now on upstream, it's, it's AWS trying, but we could use Agora. We could use, uh, it's a commodity, you know, so, so don't use, you're not really worried about getting cutting up, cut off. Exactly. Or we have a backup if we do get cut off. So, um, so don't build on top of a third party API in that same way again. And then the other was life is short. If tomorrow you got walked down the street and got hit by a bus, like, you know, would you be happy with the stuff you're working on? And like analytics was like fun and cool. Like social media analytics was cool, but it just wasn't, it wasn't our purpose. It wasn't our like calling. And we were like, okay, let's find something that we'd be really proud about that we'd want to work on forever if we can control it. Um, and then, we went through, like, we cycled through a lot of different ideas. And, we, and, and if we like something, we'd try to build, like, a prototype of it. And I've had this idea for a while, and I was sort of, like, trying to really flesh it out before I brought it to my co-founder and the team. Um, and then what ended up happening was, you know, it, it sort of, like you said, like, why us? Like, we're sort of the perfect team to actually uh, go after this. Because I'm the, I'm the right customer and user of this. I am, like, like... We have a competitive advantage because I know exactly what I would want. And that's typically like nine out of 10 times. That's usually what we should do, like for the product, because um, I am like the user. And then on the other side is like, Michael is like tech his technology chops to be able to build anything. Um, like having the combination of the right business person and the right tech person is a really hard combination to find to do this right. And I think that like, we're, we're the right team to do that. And we've built like a killer team. We've, we're nine people now. We've built like a killer team um, that is just, that we're just like the right team to build this. Like this is just, we're going to work on this forever. But you're, you're pretty lucky because most people, I bump into people all the time who will reach out through the communities on Upstream or other places and they'll say, hey, how do I find a technical co-founder? They've got business DNA. They're out there on the hustle. They're meeting people. They're doing things. But to have a technical co-founder in your pocket who's a, probably a friend, someone you trust, I assume, right? That um, can build in a lot of different types of stacks. That's not easy. What's the, how did you come across Michael and any advice for folks on yeah. how to find technical partners? So it's actually been 10 years since we met um, just recently. So we met on the original Office Hours, Nay Westheimer's project. Um, okay, I remember that. A throwback, yeah. So, love that. The story was that Office Hours just started allowing virtual Office Hours on Skype, just to date it a little bit. <laughs> um, and uh, <laughs> we ended up, um, I ended up offering Office Hours, and he took them, and he was working on a little project. He was living in LA, and um, we hit it off, and we just started chatting. I was, I was working at Aviary at the time, and I was like thinking through this idea around uh, like a, a social debate website. Cause you know, me being, being a, a Jew who likes to debate um, and I debate about everything. I just thought they were like, Oh, this could live somewhere by itself. It's not a good idea. It was a decent idea to start a relationship, 
but it wasn't a good idea that like actually would make sense and work, even though it sounds like it's a good idea. It's just one of those ideas that isn't actually a good idea. It isn't like a scalable, easy to do. Cause if you're going to have a debate, you're just going to do it on Facebook and Twitter and whatever that just happens. You're not going to take it somewhere else. Um, but anyway, so he started working with me on it and then we started just building projects together. So we got a little bit lucky, um, that we just hit it off. But at the same time, when I tell other people come to me and they say, uh, how do I meet a tech co-founder? You sort of need to just go where these people live. You know, if, if you want to meet a developer, you need to go to hackathons. You need to go to, you know, meetups. You need to go and spend time where these developers are. Um, that's really the only way to do it. Another real great trick is like, go work at a company for like a year or two and like spend time with the engineering team there and like find someone who you really vibe with. Like that's another really great way to go about it. Like I worked. I joined Aviary for two years and then Dewala for two years. And a lot of that time spent there was, I met some amazing engineers, amazing uh, designers, people I want to work with, people I've, I, I wanted to bring over when I started my own company. So that's a really great way to go about it is figure out where these people live, where they play and go spend time there. Meet them. But you, you did something else. You maintained the relationship while you were still on your own personal journey. You weren't ready to start a company. Not everyone does that. Are there tricks that you can, you know, tips you can give to business folks about how to kind of forge and sustain those relationships with, with development folks? Because one of the problems is, you know, they need engagement. They want to be excited about your projects. And I know a lot of developers who are always worried that business guy's going to take advantage of them. So how did you navigate kind of those dynamics? Any advice? Yeah, I'm trying to think back into like actually how it went down or how it worked. I think, it, I mean, I think for to some degree it was we were talking all the time. We were building, we were doing hackathons together and building side projects together, and we were just getting along. Um, but I totally understand how like it could it could be hard. I mean, it's you need to be very deliberate about this stuff. You need to you need to it needs to be a priority for you. Like I always wanted to start my own company, but I just wasn't ready. I didn't have a great idea. I didn't have the right team, and I went to these companies to learn from people who were doing it or or had done it. And I think like the best tip is to just like be very deliberate about the actions you take. Listen, you could always make mistakes early on in your career and then, and then, you know, get by it. But like I was just really deliberate about like meeting engineers. I was really deliberate about working at business development for people who knew what they were doing and like spending meaningful time there. And I think, yeah, that was, that was, that's the best advice I can give is just be very deliberate about what you're doing and how you're going about it. Okay, so let me let me take this a different direction for a second. So thank you for the advice on getting a co-founder. One of the challenges I think looking at what you're doing that's got to be really hard is community apps are tough. Uh, I failed in the space. A lot of people have failed in the space. I, I see another community app every month or two, someone coming out trying to make it work. And I don't know if I totally have it figured out why it's so hard. But very few succeed. Uh, I feel like it has a bigger death rate than most, most sectors that we're, we've got in the tech community. My hypothesis is that it requires too many features to properly service a community. You might have to have like a newsletter and a chat function and a video. It's a myriad of independent companies smushed together. What have you figured out that's working? Because upstream's getting traction, product's great. What, what is your mindset for building it and how is that allowing you to navigate kind of this valley of death? It's funny. I don't think we have it all figured out. Obviously, I mean, we're we're still in the beginning of it, and we're still figuring out what we don't even know what we don't know yet. But that being said, I do have some theses around like what makes an active and engaged community, a uh, virtual community, in person community. And I've always felt like it was a combination of two. Th- it was like a, it was an equation actually. It was an active, engaged community equals like a um, uh, like a. Uh, people, some people call it like a pot, like a pot sticker, or like a, like a, like a, sh- uh, like I'm trying, I don't want to curse, but like what's the, like you, the shit twirler or whatever, whatever, whatever it's called. Like the, the, Just use the word, curse. <laughs> the word I'm thinking of is basically like someone who is in charge of making the engine run, right? It's like right. the person who's scheduling the event, the person who is following up on stuff, the, 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 the it's the admin, it's the community admin, but there, the two things that make an active engaged community is one, a human element of a person who's in charge of the community, plus technology. And I feel like technology for the past decade or decade and a half has been just like an email list, like a newsletter, 
and maybe like uh, Eventbrite. Like that was the technology. And I think like we're now jumping a little bit ahead and there's, there's so much technology that can be built to keep a community active and engaged, even if the person in charge, like I think that that equation of an active engaged community of human plus technology, you can actually take over a lot of stuff with technology that, that will allow for slack with n- not the company slack, but like slack from the human that they can counterbalance themselves a lot more. Um, so I, a lot of the stuff that we're start, we're going to be working on from now until the end of the year is like, what more technology can we build to make it easy for you to run your community? So for example, something that I've wanted for a while and we've pushed it off because we've had other things that have been prioritized over it, but it will come before the end of the year, I think, is uh, the ability to, um, you know, uh, sort of like an if this, then that, but as an admin. So like you mm. want to go and set up and say, hey, um, if someone doesn't come to an event in like, you know, four months uh, or like meaning we've had events and they don't come in four months or six months or or like a number of events, they don't come in for the last five events, then why happens? They get reprimanded. Uh, if like they're basically like setting up rules that that um, the technology can sort of use. And then basically um, make your life a lot easier. So, you know, there's just a lot, like even just saying like, hey, if you don't have X, Y, and Z, you're not going to be accepted into my community. And like not having, not not you having to like mention that to the person, but like have it part of like the flow, have it part of the technology. So I think that there's a lot of that that could be really cool um, and that really useful. So I don't think we have it all answered. And, you know, listen, it's not live yet, but by the time this comes out, it probably will be. We're working on a product right now that will probably release at the end of this month or beginning of next month. Um, and it, it actually is not tied to the community side of things. It's actually more tied to the professional life cycle type side of things. Um, wait, when is this actually going to come out? I just want to know. I mean, there are uh, people four listening. Weeks, so. Four weeks? Yeah. Okay. You. you can hold it. I just no, drop no, no, it. No, no, cares. No. It's fine. If everyone here is okay, just keeping secrets. We're working on a product right now called Upstream Reconnect. It's really simple. You come in. And uh, you log in with your Gmail, actually, and it pulls in all of your, um, your, your emails, just the metadata of the from, the to, the duration, the frequency of sending. And it's going to tell you who you're losing touch with professionally and help you reconnect mm-hmm. with them. And it ties back to this like utility aspect that we want to include, where it's like, we want Upstream to be this like third place for professionals. And like, so the first place is home. The second place is work. The third place is usually like a club or like a church or like a synagogue or a mosque or wherever you, you know, wherever you have a group. And this idea of like this third place for professionals where you go to interact with your peers, meet new ones, reconnect with old ones and spend meaningful time together. So if we want you coming back to upstream every day, we want to build a whole like slew of like utility features that you actually get value from. So like if you use this reconnect feature that we, we have coming out. Um, and it really ties into like the theme for the rest of the year of like the world opening up and all this, all this great stuff. But it, it, you know, if we, if we do that right, like you should get your list of people that you've lost touch with and be like, Oh my God, like I haven't spoken to Mark in six months. Like, and it should lead you to create stronger bonds with people. And like I, the thesis around that is like, you, you know, the concept of like the, the, like the Dunbar 150, right? Like the, 150 people you can have professional relationships or person. I actually don't know yeah. if it's personal or professional, but explain it. It's both. Well, so, yeah. say explain it for people listening. Yeah. So I actually maybe don't know it completely, but Dunbar 150 is basically 150 relationships you can manage at a certain point until it breaks. Um, and I just feel like to some degree, uh, we, even with, even before COVID, but especially with COVID, like we've blown way past the Dunbar 150. Of like really, I don't know where half my. I don't even know where you are, Mark. Like you could be down in Miami, but you could also be back in New Jersey. Like I don't even know where you are. I'm in your house. Exactly. Just you're, you're in my backyard. <laughs> um, but like I don't know where my friends are anymore, and like right. it's and I feel like I'm I stay connected to people because I see them on social. But like I, there's some people I haven't I haven't emailed with and I haven't caught up with in a long time, and I just feel like there's there's a lot of this like human brain that has broken. And like you need a computer brain to take it to the next level, and but yeah, sorry, I know I went on a little no, bit of a tangent. No, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. 
But the, it's fascinating. So the, the last, the last piece of this is like the way I sort of see it is we prioritize this feature, this utility feature, because like if the world didn't exist, like it meaning, sorry, that doesn't make any sense. If the, if the, um, if, if you didn't take into account what's going on in the world and it was just like our product roadmap and how we're thinking about things and how we're building things, this would not be the next feature. The next feature would be more admin tools, like helping them do all those things like the, the, the Zapier style type of stuff. If it was just us and like sitting there and figuring out what our users wanted, it would probably just be admin tools. It'd be cool new, uh, like, uh, event features and things like that. But. I've recently, and this sort of goes into one of the questions we were talking about or that you emailed me around, was like product and team, like what makes a successful company? It's product, it's team, it's, you know, it's market and it's timing. Those are like traction timing. And I used to think it was all about product and team. I was like, ah, if you have a great team with a great product, you can do anything. And then I've recently changed my mind around that. And I actually believe it's actually more timing and market. Which I think investors like just know, like, like they instinctively know. And that's why they, they invest in really, they look for really big markets. But like you could have a really great team with a really great product, something like Path, right? Really great team, really great product. The market and timing just weren't right for Path. And like you have a great team, great product, you'll run into a wall because market and timing will always win. But if you have a mediocre team with a mediocre product in a massive market with great timing, like you will have a meaningful outcome. And the reason I mention this is because if you take into account what's happening in the world, the world's opening up, the big themes for the rest of the year are going to be travel, IRL, reconnecting with friends, dinners, concerts, sports games, all that stuff. And like virtual events is going to go from like a weekly thing to like a monthly thing. It's still going to exist. It's still going to be important. It's just going to be for the next six months, I think there's going to be this snapback. So this product was on our roadmap, but we were going to start working on it in the summer at the end of the year. We just decided to just reprioritize things. So I, I just wanted to give a little bit of, of context around that. But that was an yeah. entire company, what you're just talking about. It, you've reduced to a feature of your company. And it comes back to what I was saying before about what communities, one of the challenges with them, mm -hmm. communities apps, is you have to build so many, in, you have to smush so many companies together. And that has to work. You guys seem to be doing it well. One of the things I think is working really well in the app is you're reducing these companies down to discrete, simple features. And so it seems to be more sustainable. But that, there, was a, there was at least one company before that che checked your kind of follow-up heat, heat map. I think it was Contactly, something like that. Yeah. And figured out who you were falling off with and would prompt you to reach out. That was a SaaS tool. Yeah. You're, you're building it as feature number 48 on upstream. So the, it's great that you mentioned that because like I sort of mentioned it earlier, there's three things that LinkedIn has dropped the ball on. One is like mm -hmm. groups. Three was like strength of relationship, which this reconnect product is our first foray into that because you, you need to know who you know and how well you know them to some degree to know who you're losing touch with. But that's for another conversation. Sure. The middle one was the API. And that's, I think that actually ties it all together in my, you know, com discombobulated brain is that like <laughs> to do this right to do we need to build a platform a professional platform and yeah we'll be the first developer on it we may be the only developer on it for a while but like eventually we'll have an mm -hmm. api that you can build on top of an upstream community the upstream ecosystem and you could build your own applications um and that to answer like to to talk about what you're saying is like yeah but like why not? Why can't we have all these cool companies that do these little things in this ecosystem building things on top of us? That's going to take some time. You don't build an ecosystem yep. overnight. But like, again, Michael and I have done APIs for the past decade. So we know that stuff. We know that we've used right. other people's ecosystems. We've built, used other people's APIs. So building our own API, like we, we know how to do it when we're ready. So I want to come back to something. We, we kind of covered three things in uh, the last bit. I want to kind of respond to it. The idea that you're building features to help people be more effective at managing is very powerful because communities kind of ebb and flow as people change leadership, especially almost all of them are volunteer run. And that's very challenging. So the idea of streamlining it, super powering people with technology is a great concept. Um, let me just shift gears for one second here. Uh, as a CEO and a founder here, What's the most challenging thing you've faced with Upstream so far? What's been your biggest hurdle and 
How'd you handle it? What can people learn from it? Um, yeah, challenges. I mean, every day in a startup is a challenge. It's the, it's the, all the switching you have to do every, every, every meetings, uh, like, a context switching or like situation switching, you know, you go to one conversation about hiring, then your next conversation is about, you know, getting guest speakers for your next event. And the next conversation is about fundraising. And it's just, it's a lot of switching. Um, how does that affect you? Um, I'm okay with it because I have like crazy ADD. So it's like, it's not, it's actually, it works. But that be- being said, um, it, it's hard for employees sometimes, you know, um, you know, if you're not used to doing everything all the time. Um, I don't know if you watch the Bo Burnham uh, uh, inside a Netflix special. Phenomenal. If you haven't watched it, it's, f- it's mind blowingly phenomenal. But there's okay, a song we'll, called we'll put that I in the want- show notes. Yeah, definitely, definitely worth watching. Anyone who's listening, if you haven't, if you've seen it, give me a little thumbs up if you liked it. But um, it's uh, there's a song there called "Everything All of the Time." It's about the internet and stuff, and that's startups. It's like a little bit of everything all the time, um, and that doesn't work for everybody. Like that is overwhelming for a lot of people. So yeah, it's just I think that's that's been I. It never used to bother me, but when it starts to bother employees, and then you're like, oh, okay, yeah, I am switching all the time, all these things. Um, Is there something you've figured out to help the staff who struggles with it navigate it? Is there a style change you've made or some structure you've put into the agenda? What, what do you do? Yeah, it, there's no great answer, but I mean, what I've at least shared with, with the people that struggle with it is like, listen, not everything's as important. So like, yeah, you're context switching, but like, don't worry too much about being perfect at everything because you're just not going to be more like figure out what the important things are, figure out the priorities and, and make sure you don't mess those up. But the other stuff is like, you know, do your best and that's it. Like, don't, don't, don't stress too much about that stuff because it's, it's, you're, you'll, you'll make yourself crazy. Um, you know, you, you can't be amazing at everything. Um, so just be amazing at the things that you need to be amazing at and everything else, do your best. But don't don't uh, don't overextend yourself. You know what I mean. I personally struggle with it. To be honest with you, I I, I feel like I operate well in the constant transition. But what happens to me at the end of the day, seven, eight, nine p.m., my brain's melted. Yeah, and I just I have a routine now of every day I got to watch a half hour of TV just to kind of wind down a little bit. But there's um, it's invigorating in the moment, but it, I think it is um, it uses up the batteries. You know, it's interesting you say this. So I just caught up with a friend who has, I want to say seven employees, a uh, hot startup. It just raised like five, 10 million bucks. Um, it's not public yet, but a hot startup. Um, and he just started realizing people were getting really burnt out on the team. Like everyone was working all the time. And there was like a sudden departure from the team. And there was just like, he was realizing like, there's, this is just uh, whatever. He made everyone take, I think, a... Uh, I have to look at how many days, but I think it was like 10 days off. Yeah. Um, and everyone had to be off and delete Slack from your phone. And it couldn't work if anyone was coming on because then other people feel like they're not getting their stuff done. Now, they're in something that you don't need to be live every They're building. Their, it's uh, very much an R&D play now. They don't have a lot of users yet. Right. But it's like it could be very big. Um, and I thought that was fascinating because he said it really worked. Like everyone came back with fresh ideas, fresh legs, and like super jam to get going. Um, but they got the rest they needed. They really did. Um, I, we, we couldn't do that. But I was like, oh man, I wish I could, you know? But vacations are a big deal. I mean, that's one of the things I do with a lot of the CEOs I work with. It's funny. It seems like an unimportant part of a role for someone like me, but it's not, is forcing people to take vacations. Right, you've got yeah. the, everyone overachievers with too much responsibility, too much on the line, and you can tell when they're getting burned out. They start getting edgy and snippy, right? Yeah, and it's destructive. So it's a big yeah. thing. Brad Feld used to write. This is I don't know how many decades ago, but Brad Feld I remember had blew my mind a little bit. He suggested that the right balance for startup vacations was every seventh week. Now a lot of companies can't support that, can't afford that, whatever. There's an American culture around vacation, but there is a you know, we're not slow burning marathon always in startups. We're often sprinting and having that moment to take a break and a breather, I think is important. Okay. I want to take us a different direction. Um, we've talked, uh, we obviously know upstream is about communities 
and you run one of the communities on Upstream, the NFT community with your buddy Drew Austin of Redbeard Ventures. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you're all obviously all over the NFT game. Indeed. Can you give a quick overview on NFTs for the newbies listening? Yeah. So NFTs. Okay. So we're we're talking about. Uh, so I got into them. Uh, so I, uh, actually, to give some context, I was at Dwala, the payment startup based in Iowa, and from 2012 to 2014, Dwala was one of the first ways to get money in and out of Bitcoin. So when I joined, Dwala was. I think Bitcoin is four dollars because Bitcoin was a thing. Like we were talking about, Michael, my co-founder, was mining it. We used to have an Ethereum rig in the office back in the day. This is mm-hmm. at, this is at Shrink. So we were like we're very uh, tech uh, or crypto knowledgeable team, um, and we joined Dwala. So I got I, I had like history. It was like you'd fund your Dwala account, you'd move it to Mount Gox um, uh, or like Silk Road or whatever. Like basically fund right. Silk Road. Um, Anyway, so we ended up, um, my buddy Drew was here in like December. He was in, he was in uh, Miami and we caught up and he was showing me these, and I knew about crypto kitties. I knew about all that stuff because USB let it, but he was showing me um, NBA Top Shot in like just in December and like NBA Top Shot took off like mid January, beginning of February, really, uh, end of January. And he was showing me, he's like, I just spent like 1500 bucks buying this like Zion Williamson uh like you know legendary hollow moment i'm like what are you doing you like this is this is irresponsible right. you're a father <laughs> you know you gotta you gotta keep this money put your kid through college and um he's like no this is gonna blow up he's like go buy a pack buy a pack and experience it and i was like okay sure i waited a week which was in a very expensive week that i waited and it basically went from series two to series, uh, series one to series two in that week. Um, and uh, anyway, I bought it. I was like, oh, this is sort of cool. I, I collected Pokemon cards. I actually, my mom is looking for all my Pokemon cards in storage because I have like generation one, like Charizard. Every, I have them all. They're in some right. form somewhere in the store. What are those worth? What are those worth? Six figures easily. Like yeah, even wow. in not the even in not great condition, six figures. If you have a like the original, um, if you have it in like pristine condition, it's worth like seven fifty. Like wow, yeah, it's expensive. Um, but I used to play a tournament, so anyway, I, I got it. I was like, oh, this is cool. So I ended up buying a bunch of packs, and then a few weeks later, it sort of took off. And then Drew and I were chatting, and we're like, all right, we should do this NFT community. But so your question was, what are NFTs? NFTs are basically yeah, give the primer. Yeah, so it's like it's sort of like these digital collectibles. So. There's a lot of ways to think about it. A lot of people are, are creating NFT non-fungible tokens. And they're basically saying like, okay, I'm taking this, this, uh, this you know, like, like the, the best way to think about it is you have like basketball cards or like baseball cards. A Babe Ruth or Mickey Mantle, like rookie card is worth millions of dollars. Um, the, like this company called Dapper Labs came out and said, okay, we're going to take the M- MBA, but instead of taking uh, like a, a static moment, like a static card, and then like buying a digital version of that, it said we're going to take a moment. So it could be a block, it could be assist, it could be a points, it could be a dunk, whatever it is. It's a little video clip. It's a little video clip. We're going to take this moment and we're going to basically, we're going to mint them on the blockchain so that they, everyone knows how many are made. Everyone knows how many are, um, who it is, uh, and the value, and who owns what. And essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to sell them in packs. So you buy a pack, and you get a handful of moments. And those moments, um, there's a whole marketplace to buy and sell them. And this just blew up. So that, that's NBA Top Shot. But, but the concept of the NFT is basically anything that is tokenized. Um, that that you can basically that's non fungible, and w- there's a bunch of th- but these words confuse yeah. everybody. I, I think it make it the, the names almost make it the concept harder than it is. Yeah, right. That's My true. understanding of it is the blockchain says that this moment or any digital asset, it could be a picture, it could be anything, is the unique one that someone purchased. Yes, and they're solving that problem of copy paste. 
Because that doesn't work well if you're trying to say this is something unique and scarce. Yes. Is that right? Uh, yes. So, I mean, obviously, there's a lot of different types of, of NFTs. Now, I'll preface this thing is like, I think 90% of NFTs are worthless. Um, and what I mean by that is, and, and Drew says 99% of NFTs are worthless. I think, I think it's 90. Um, there's four reasons why I think uh, an NFT is worth something. Well, the first is IP. So if you have um, IP like the NBA, I think that's worth something. And that is, to me, you know, when you look at sort of the, um, uh, the NBA, the MLB, whatever, like that will, the Zion Williamson rookie uh, top shot will be worth something because that's like the new world. You know what I mean? It's like, uh, but I don't think like every single NBA top shot moment is going to be worth something. It's going to be like basketball cards where like you're, you're like, if you have some player who's, who's like a D lister, uh, I mean, listen, if you're in the NBA, you're, you're good, but like, you know, if you're sitting the bench on, on a non-playoff team and you're not good, um, your moment's not going to be worth much. Uh, but if you have a little LeBron James, obviously it's going to be worth something. So I, I, I'd focus for like that type of stuff on like the quality, the, the best players and things like that. But there's IP. The IP is going to be worth something. Sports, movies, Disney. You know what Disney's going to get into this. Uh, you know, Marvel's going to get into this. Like that stuff's worth something. So then, then there's utility. And when I think about utility, I think about like, can I earn money from this thing? So Zed falls into this category. Zed is digital horse racing. And <laughs> Zach, horses never die. Uh, but digital horse racing, you can buy a horse where they have a big drop tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern time if you want to get your first horse. But you can, you can um, buy a horse and sell the horse if you want. You can race the horse against other horses and earn money. Or you can breed your horse and either have earn a stud fee or you can earn the fowl, like the, uh, the offspring, if you're the female. That to me is interesting because I have a bunch of horses, but I've bred and I've made a few thousand dollars just breeding horses. I've raced my horses and I've made a few thousand dollars racing the horses. That to me is really interesting because if you can make money off this thing, then there's inherent, you know, there's, it can be more valuable. So it's like an investment in that scenario. You're, yeah. you're buying a digital asset. And in the economy they've created, you can make money with it. Yeah. So think about other things like uh, like virtual land. Like imagine a world where the oasis is a, a real thing from like Ready Player One. And there's land and you have land and people pay rent and people want to spend time in, in your land. And they, they, you know, you can make money off that. Like I'm, I think I'm trying to look into figure out like what is the virtual land that's going to be the one. Um, and I think owning a little bit of land on each one may probably make sense because Whichever one wins is going to be an outsized win. So it's like a, a, a little bit of a venture play there. Um, and then sort of the other two that I think are interesting is one is, is access. So Gary V did this. Um, also, uh, this thing called Board Ape Yacht Club has done this really well. And it's like, if you own this NFT, if you own the board, a board ape, you have access now to the board ape community. There's 10,000 board apes and you're one of them. There's Gary V said, if you own these V friends, you can now go to one of his conferences. I think that there's something really interesting about like clubs and the ability to gain access to locations and things and places that if you own um, uh, an NFT that you can now uh, get access to sports games. Sometimes they'll give you an NFT for, for showing up. It's, it's a digital ticket. It's, it's just where it's, it's using blockchain as a database system for a digital yeah. ticket. And then the last one okay. is art. The last one's art. So like, you know, digital art, I mean, in real life, art is worth something. So digital art, uh, you can make an argument, you know, there's value. A one of ones, someone who either becomes famous or, or is, a, is a big artist. Like, you know, the creator of Rick and Morty did some, some, some virtual uh, uh, NFTs that I think is interesting. If you like Rick and Morty, then maybe you want to own this one of one thing. So. Um, but I think there will be like the, the Picasso and the Van Gogh, uh, virtual NFTs does, you know, maybe not, doesn't exist yet, but like, be, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe it's Beeple, maybe Beeple's Picasso, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm making this up, but I think that there's, there's value in there. Everything else, if there's no value and it's just like, oh, this is a clip of whatever, like all, like it, going back to the utility, for example, like little Dicky, who's a rapper, 
just made it so like this song that he's releasing that anyone who owns the NFT is actually co-owners of the royalty. So like there's a lot of really interesting stuff you could play that. Someone just hit me up about like owning stock footage of like Woodstock and apparently it goes for like $7,500 for every six seconds. So they want to turn it into an NFT and maybe sell it off and let people, you know, own own the rights a little bit to it as well. So there's some cool stuff. Um, as some person owns like eight minutes of Woodstock. Uh, mm. And he, he just hit me up literally like today. Um, so I don't know. There's just mm. there's cool stuff like that that I think uh, could be really interesting. Uh, but it's still very early with NFTs. Right. Y- you were quoted in the New York Times in reference to NFTs saying... This is going to either be the smartest or stupidest thing I've ever done. I'll either buy a house with the money I'll make from it, or I'll never show my face again this year. Yeah. What's it going to be? <laughs> Listen, if I wanted to cash out today, I could probably do the house already. So it's, right. uh, how it's, much is the uh, how much is the horse stable worth? The horse stable, um, it's worth a lot. It's worth it's a uh, lot, right? Yeah, it's worth you know, like it's worth enough. Um, now I own. Let's the, talk about this for a second. What's the value? Is the value based on market transactions, or are the platform companies saying, "Hey, uh, we want to drive appreciation and excitement, so we're going to say it's worth X dollars now, and it's no, arbitrary." There, there, there's the retail value of it, and then there's also what secondary markets are selling it for. So, for example, a Z1 is is going for. It's a type of horse. A Z1 is the most valuable horse that you could buy. It goes from Z1 okay. to Z10. A Z1, it's called a Nakamoto. A Z1 Nakamoto um, is retailed for, I think, $38,000 that you could buy it during a drop. They're going secondary. Just an unraced, unbred Z1 is going secondary for, for 50 k um, each. There's only going to ever be 1,000 Z1 Nakamotos. And I think once they all sell out, which they're only like, 200 left, I think, out of the 1,000. Once they all sell out, it's going to be very hard for, to buy one for less than 100 grand, in my opinion, even a bad one. And is it easy to sell them? Is the secondary market so liquid where if you put it up, you know, this, this is when you look at your value, you're like, okay, that's real value. I have an option on that. If I wanted to sell my Z1, uh, I've, I've, I have four Z1s. But uh, if I wanted to sell one of my Z1s, I could probably do it um, today. Easy. That's awesome. Okay. Now, how yeah. does and I can undercut the, the market people, a little bit and it easily will sell? But like, I could, I could probably so, even sell for a premium. Okay. When I when I hear about the NFT craze when it first came out, it seemed like a lot of people who had missed out on Bitcoin getting in early were like, "Holy shit, this is the next Bitcoin! I got to jump in." Mm-hmm. First movers, you know, the game here is being in early. Uh, and there was fear of missing out and everyone kind of focused on it. Um, do you, one of the things that's different about this versus Bitcoin is Bitcoin has a finite supply. Now there's some argue in crypto, there's no finite supply because everyone's launching a new coin every other day. It's a new currency being created. Mm -hmm. Do you look at this and think that the supply is appropriately managed where the values will hold, or do you think they'll fluctuate? I, I think, think the, it, the bottom it, will come it goes out. project to bro- project. So project to project. Okay. So Drew is, is on the record many times think, saying that like, he thinks that there's going to be a win. Like we haven't, we, the, we, uh, NBA Top Shot got really overvalued really quickly. Um, because there's just like it flooded the market and then there was just a lot of moments and they kept minting more moments. So it's like they, they made some issues. But I think long term they'll be fine. I think everyone who came in for series two, which is about to end, when series three starts and they open it up to China and to other countries, people are gonna be like, Oh, you have a series two moment. That's amazing. Like it's always going to be like, you know, Oh, you know, the things that are like discontinued get more hot, but taking that aside for a second, the, there's going to be a winter for NFTs, just like there was for, uh, ICOs, you know, the ICOs, the initial coin offerings, Mm -hmm. super hot 2017, winter 2018 2019 basically 2020 even. do you think they're coming back do you think icos are gonna come they back have come back all dead? these companies are are basically coins uh everything from flow to solana to doge they're all coins i mean um they're just like basically all the companies that were just not real they all died and then all the real ones 
uh, just put their heads down and started building. And then mm -hmm. DeFi came out. So there's going to be a winter for NFTs, a real winter. Now you'll be able to, it may, it may be if like Ethereum goes down a lot, but I think Ethereum is going to be at like 10K by the end of the year. Um, but I think like there's going to be a winter for a lot of NFTs is just going to be worthless. And then it's going to come back with the metaverse. And that's like what you know, everyone who knows anything, or at least the people that I find to be intelligent, say that the metaverse is the big thing. So it's like the, 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 the worlds is like where the biggest opportunity is for the NFT. Explain that. Explain metaverse for people who aren't So familiar. metaverse is like, is like, you know, you, everything from Bitmoji to Genies to even Zed. Like Zed, they say, is like it's a parallel universe where horse racing is the number one like job for everybody um and everyone owns horses and they race them like world building um if anyone here is you know or anyone listening eventually to this thing is interested in like the you know comic books and 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 you know world building i mean this is this is the what people believe is going to be the the big opportunity like the dream is you build a world you're making like passive income because you own land and people are paying you to use your your racetrack or use your building or whatever it is and you're earning this passive income and you could do whatever you want in the real world because you're making enough money to, to pay your rent in in the metaverse is that where zed run goes eventually people are buying land and owning racetracks or do you think it's they said they're eventually going to sell some racetracks that you could buy them um I think the company that's probably poised the best for like the the metaverse is is actually Epic Games, you know. To some mm -hmm. degree, Epic Games, uh, you know, it's a it's a place you go and you battle and you, and you battle royale and all that stuff. But they have the like if if you go and you listen to the Apple versus Epic Games courtroom thing, the Tim Sweeney, the founder of Epic Games, was talking a lot about the metaverse. Like he had to explain a lot of this stuff. It's actually a great read. Mm -hmm. um, and I think like Epic is really, really poised. I think Snap is trying to figure out some stuff around the metaverse with Bitmoji and, and the live maps and stuff like that. There's a, there's some, I mean, listen, the metaverse is Oasis. If you ever read Ready Player One or you ever saw the movie, that, yep. that, that's the metaverse. Um, and Fantastic. like you, you buy like a pair of shoes in the metaverse, like, and you open up your, your, your coat and you've got all these different, you've got guns, you've got whatever, you've got whatever you want. Um, and like, you know, you own digital versions of them. And I thought, I thought like a Ro Roblox is also a really big metaverse player. I right. think I saw in Roblox, like someone sold a handbag, like a Gucci handbag or a Fendi handbag or a Prada handbag for more than what it actually costs in the real world. Hmm. And it's just like, I don't know that to me, that's really fascinating stuff. Alex, this was awesome. Thanks for making time. Yeah, of course. Thanks for having me. This was fun. Awesome. So I have yet to dive too deep into the world of NFTs, but maybe my next investment will be a digital horse stable. Super big thanks to Alex for explaining all of the NFT stuff and sharing the story behind Upstream. I'm pretty excited to watch them roll out more features and continue to fine tune the platform. I think it's going to have a big impact. If you like what you heard, please hook us up with a like or a five star review and feel free to share with a friend. You can find me on Twitter at MPD. And to hear more of my conversations with innovators, subscribe on YouTube, Facebook, or any major podcast platform. Just search for innovation with Mark Peter Davis.